Now, from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy, and welcome to Facing South Florida. Events move so fast that sometimes we fail to give them their due. And so I want to do something a little different this morning. As we know, the legislature passed a bill that included increased funding for mental health and counseling and school police. But it also included raising the age to buy a firearm to 21, mandated a three-day waiting period, and gave police increased powers to seize weapons from dangerous individuals. These were the first gun restrictions passed in Tallahassee in more than 20 years. And there was a moment before the final vote was taken where it looked like the bill could have gone either way. And that's when Carl Springs State Representative Jared Moskowitz rose to speak. Now, the sound is a little long, but I, I didn't want to edit it because I wanted you to hear it for yourselves. He started off talking about his son, Samuel, a four-year-old who was eager to learn how to write. So Moskowitz signed him up to take a writing class. That writing class was going on in Parkland on the afternoon of February 14th, around the corner from Douglas. And that class was taught by Jen Guttenberg. You see, she lost her daughter, Jamie, while she was teaching. My son had a right. put my kid in the closet when her daughter died. I wanted to say thank you at the funeral. I didn't know how to do that. I hope that when I push the green button, that, that will show all the appreciation that I need and that she needs. You don't need to stand with me. I don't need you to stand with me. I need you to stand with the families. Push the green button. Thank you. After that speech, the bill passed. Joining me now is State Representative Jared Moskowitz, who represents the area of Coral Springs. Jared, thank you very much for coming in. Jim, good morning. Um, that moment, as you, as you rose to speak, you talked about a number of things, and we'll get into that, but do you remember, how well do you remember that moment? I mean, it seems out of body to probably watch it now. Um, I, I don't remember the exact moment, and I, I actually, the, the moments after that are, are kind of also a blur. I know that the bill passed, and then I just was relieved and kind of just walked away and needed my space because the, the whole three weeks leading up to that moment, I mean, that was the culmination of what going to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, seeing what happened, uh, going to the hotel, being with the families when, you know, when they were being notified that their kids were still in the building, um, going to funerals, and then immediately going up to Tallahassee and ha trying to get a bill done in less than three weeks. You, you, you mentioned just then the idea of going to the hotel. You flew down that night along with, uh, I think it was uh, um, it was Representative Represent Kristen Jacobs. And Kristen Jacobs, right. And you came down. You First thing that you did was you went to the side of the school and you were shown some video and, and given something of a tour. What was that like? Yeah, so my wife, I was on the floor of the house. We were debating a tourist development bill. My wife called me. She was crying. She had just passed the school and saw um, that there were, you know, dozens and dozens of police police showing up to the site. Uh, she then went to my son's uh, preschool, which is around the corner, to try to get him, but he was obviously on lockdown. So I flew home, uh, got to Douglas around 8.30 at night. We, we met with uh, BSO. We had gotten given us some information that they could release at the time. The governor and Pam Bondi held a, a press conference, and then we went over to the, the hotel afterwards. The governor, I think, went to the hospitals. Did you go to the school first? I mean, did you go, did you see what was inside the school? So uh, we did the tour of the school the next day, because uh, it was already nighttime. So the next day, uh, BSL walked us through uh, where the Parkland shooter showed up, how it happened, where he entered the building. Obviously, I saw the windows with bullet holes in them, dozens of 
bullet holes in them. He was trying to shoot students from the third floor as they were escaping. And then obviously I saw where uh, two folks uh, had e either dragged themselves out or had been moved out of the building and, and, and unfortunately passed away in front of the door. And then I saw down the hallway where you could see people were shot up against the wall. Um, you, you use, use that phrase, shot up against the wall. I just wasn't clear. Did, or is it your understanding that he actually tried to line people up against the wall or they just shot them near near walls? Yeah, no, it, it, from, from our vantage point, it looks like in, in particular one victim, he shot somebody who then unfortunately died against the wall. You talked about going to the, to the Marriott, I think it was the Marriott in Coral Springs where families who had loved ones who were missing were gathered. You, you Describe that scene going into that room and seeing those families who thought that their loved ones were missing. Uh, it's haunting. I mean, there were hundreds of people there because it was families, it was friends, it was aunts, uncles, nephews, brothers, sisters. They hadn't heard from their kid since 2.30. Uh, they were on the floor different races, religions, praying, praying that their kid potentially was you know, mangled in a hospital rather than in the building. Um, it was the longest six hours. Six hours they sat there waiting to find, because they were still trying to identify the bodies. They knew people who were dead, they just didn't have the idea of who. Yeah, Jim, the, 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 the Parkland shooter, and I don't want to say his name, he, he shot a lot of these kids several times, some of them in the head, and so without any identification on them, it was tough to identify them. Uh, and so that took a long period of time. What was frustrating is nobody would talk to the families. And I wasn't one of the families, but I was getting frustrated for them because the idea that you're sitting in a hotel room and you don't know where your kid is and no one will talk to you, uh, both the FBI and BSO wouldn't tell them anything until they, they had everybody ID'd. Uh, and so they didn't start that process until 12.30 in the morning, it went until three o'clock, uh, and I didn't hear. And how did it work, though? How would they do it? They would pull family out one by one, and they would move them into a separate room. That separate room, though, was just there's a hotel, so walls are separated by partitions. Um, and you didn't hear crying, Jim. You heard screaming. They, were, I mean, screaming that uh, will haunt me the rest of my life. The the. Are you surprised that, that you were able to accomplish, that the state was able to accomplish what it did? I know it didn't go far enough for you and for others, but just what it did accomplish. Yeah, I mean, the first thing out of my mouth when someone stuck a camera in front of my face the next day was, we'll do nothing. Because that's what we did after Pulse. I tried to get us into special session. I led that effort trying to pull um, the state reps and the state senators through the Secretary of State to get us back into special session, and we refused to do so. So I was already conditioned that we would do nothing. Um, one of the ideas that I had and Senator Book had is I would bring the speaker uh, to the school and I brought the appropriations chair, Carlos Trio, to the school and she brought the Senate president and Senate majority to the school. I needed them to see this. I needed this to be real. I didn't want this to be desensitized through television. They needed to see what it looks like when a school has bullet holes through the wall and people are dying in front of the front door. I wasn't going to let them get off the hook. Uh, and I think that had a dramatic impact. It also had an impact that we were in session that they, there were three weeks in which we had to do something. And then the kids came, and they came like an army. And then the parents that should have been grieving turned into lobbyists. Um, I played a, 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 a small part in this. This was a community effort. Uh, but I, listen, I'm happy that Republicans and Democrats came together because it was, it could have been easy for us to go into our corners, the Republicans to say, you know, we're not doing this, and the Democrats could say it's not enough or we don't like this component. Look, there are things I don't like in the bill, and there are things I don't think the bill goes far enough. But the idea that the other option was to do nothing was just not acceptable to me. Let's, let's, let's hold it here. We'll take a break. We'll come back, and let's talk a little bit more specific about the bill and about where this goes from here, because I don't think this is a protest anymore. I think what the kids have started is a movement, and we'll pick that up on the other side. We'll be right back.